Hello, welcome to Cast. I'm your host tonight, Barry Kesselman, and uh, we have a very special guest today. Last time, if you've been watching along with us, as you hope you have, and you've heard about superstars, and satellites, and what have you, and intellectual things. Well, today we're going to do what every man in America likes. We're going to talk about sports. And we're going to do it with a sportscaster who has uh, who's been in the New York area doing a lot of broadcasting with local stations and uh, an announcer for the New York Mets when no one listens to the Mets. <laughs> but he'll, he'll talk to about that. So it's my real pleasure to introduce you to Bob Berg. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, Bob. And welcome. Uh, we are looking forward to sports in America as through your eyes, which I understand is the non statistical part. Well, yeah. I mean, everybody knows about millionaires in various sports these days. Quote, not like the, I'm not sure it's the good old days, but just those days. But everything has obviously changed. Um, players make fortunes. I know that. Talking about baseball, um, pitchers back when were expected to go nine innings or close. Now they're taught to go one inning and throw the ball 98 miles an hour, and they can make a lot of money doing the one inning. Uh, so just something basic like that. Something basic like back in the days um, when a hitter had two strikes, with some exceptions. They would choke up on the bat a little bit. You don't ever, I don't think, see anybody ever choking up anymore. The money's in the home runs, and what did they used to say? The, the singles hitters drive Chevrolets, the home run hitters drive Cadillacs. Well, it is an element of truth to that. It's probably staying in muscle from the steroids. <laughs> but anyway, talking about baseball, I think you got your start in baseball. Uh, and I think you did, you accomplished something that's sort of part of the lead in this day and age in college. Could you tell me a bit about that? Well, um, I went to NYU on a baseball scholarship, and we played in a league then, just before the Big East and everything else, called the um, Metropolitan League or Conference. It was NYU, St. John's, uh, Manhattan, Hofstra. City College, Brooklyn College, Wagner, from Staten Island. Mm -hmm. And the thing that was so nice, Barry, was um, my senior year, we had a very good team, but so did St. John's. They were always good. Anyway, to make a long story short, we beat them out for the conference championship. And the conference championship meant an automatic bid to the NCAA regionals. So we were in. St. John's was then on the strength of their winning record. Penn State and Delaware. My alma mater. Which one? Penn State? Well, I hate to tell you, we beat Penn State. St. John's beat Delaware. And then we beat St. John's to be the District 2 rep for the College World Series. And no NYU team had ever been out there before in Omaha. And it was terrific. You know, we lost to Arizona. Um, and then Wyoming the next day, but it was a great experience. And then I went with the Giants. This was before the draft. Uh, you signed with whatever team was interested in you and who you would like to be with. So I lasted two years in the minors. Um, I like to say that I fooled them for two years, but and then into the real world. So that was the end of that. And you were pitcher? Yes. Big fastball? Mm. Not big time, but okay. It's a pretty good hook. And ah, well, that would be a hook for uh, the rest of our conversation. Okay. So after you hooked through the, uh, the Giants organization, where did you land to? Well, I, the one year with the Giants was out in Hastings, Nebraska. And then I wound up in what they then called an outlaw league, which wasn't affiliated with any team, but they paid well. And this was in Brantford, Ontario. So I spent my second and final year pitching up in Canada. So you're an international star. International. <laughs> but then you moved off somewhere along the line to uh, basketball and broadcasting and announcing. I'm not sure which, but I'd really like to hear. I mean, you're the professional here. I guess, well, having a line. I actually went to work for an ad agency, buying time, went to a rep 
as they called it then, spelling time. And then about seven or eight years after I did, did all that, I decided to give uh, broadcasting a try. And it started out slowly. The first thing I ever did was a radio report. I was working at WNEW at the time. AM. The old days. Um, and I did some Davis Cup reports from North Carolina. And then I wound up doing the last three games of the 74 season, I think, with the Nets. Um, the color commentator was famous baseball player Bob Gibson. But he had to go back to spring training. So it helped the person, right? Uh, I think he's from the Midwest, I believe. Well, there you go. I know he went to Creighton. I didn't know him a lot off when I was still kidding. He um, had to miss the final three games. And I went over to Channel 11 on my own and asked them, look, I played in college. Um, I promise I won't say bleep on the air. Let me do the last three games. And for some strange reason, they said, go ahead. And I did it. And say you're an actor at WPIX. That was, yes, it was PIX carrying the game thing. Oh, that, yeah. And then you moved off, somewhere along the way, you moved off to uh, one of the uh, network affiliates. Well, I was at PIX um, for five years doing weekend sports and weekday reporting. And I went over to Channel 2, WCBS, doing the same thing, backing up Warner Wolf at the time, doing weekend anchoring and weekday reporting. And then I left there, um, and I went back to PIX. This comes under the heading of everybody out there, don't burn any bridges. You never know when they need you again. So I had a 10-year career at Channel 11, broken in two five-year segments. That was a bit unusual. Now, I, I understand you also played basketball. I was on the team in college, but in all honesty, I spent more time on the bench than Judge Judy. I hear that you were what they call a 30 30. Ooh, you know that. All right. We had to be either up by 30 or down by 30 for me to get in. <laughs> but it led to a good baseball season, so we didn't care. Oh, uh, very good. Very good. And tennis. Which is where I mentioned it. Yeah. yeah, well, it was a good sport to take up later. Um, and I think I was in my 30s when I started. Because, and you, you know, it's a fun game and you can play into your 90s. I was oh, fortunate yeah. enough to be around by then. But uh, great game and everything. You know, it had all the running and conditioning that golf doesn't. Um, so I was one of many, many guys who played basketball that took up tennis. I want to get into that. You brought me to something else uh, about basketball and baseball and what have you. So, you have here <laughs> a basketball. The basketball. This is a basketball. That's a basketball. I'm back here. Okay. So, you have to start, you have some basketball, Jones player, and then uh, move to off. Oh my God! I need two, two steam or four steam. <laughs> For me, I could, if I could get it on three hops to the catch, I can see myself playing some tennis and some tennis. And then you're not going to juggle stuff, you know. And then you make golf. Okay. I've heard. This is what I want to check. I mean, you certainly handle a lot of balls. Mm-hmm. But I've heard that the smaller the ball. When you play again, the smaller the ball in the game that you play with, the smaller your your brain power. And I was wondering if that's a correlation of like Congress. Because I think they your golf is more of <laughs> I have never heard that before. No, well, maybe it's a interesting theory. I don't know if it's a right? But uh, in tennis, you uh, you also do some broadcasting in tennis, right? Yes. Um, I worked for ESPN in the early days. We did some collegiate tennis. And then I uh, worked for World Championship Tennis, uh, owned by Lamar Hunt, for three years. That was fun. That was going from town to town and broadcasting the tournament results. Not the results, the play-by-play. Um, you know, funny thing, too, Barry. We, um, I was doing the Nets games at the time when they had Judy Serving, Dr. J. And I was doing a tennis tournament in Columbus, Ohio, the Buckeye Boys Tournament. 
I think they still have it, but <clears throat> I'm not sure. But once the players found out that I did the Nets games, it was like, mass. what Dr. J like? Can you really jump like that? You know, boom. The guys in one sport really, is a safe rule, can really commiserate with, with stars from other sports because they know how tough it is to be good in what they're doing, or they should know. And some of the stars in the sport are sure they can know. Celebrities in their mind. Mm-hmm. You told me a story once about Oh, yeah, I guess uh, you could title this one How to Stop Building a Stasket when he goes on one of his tirades. And tennis fans who have seen him over the years remember how he loves nothing better than to berate an official and they go arguing on the court and the official, you know, gives it back to him and he, he just eats it up. Anyway, the director of the tournament that we were in at the time was, was in Salisbury, Maryland. And the tournament director was Mike Davis, the next British Davis Cupper, who probably knows more about the inner workings of tennis than any human on earth. I mean, he really knows what's going on. But he's the, we're in the truck. He's looking at all, mon- at all the monitors. And he sees this passage carrying on and carrying on. I suddenly hear the door of the truck close. And what happened to Mike? Well, he's walking on to the court. And he doesn't say a word. He walks onto the court, pulls down his single sticks, walks up to the chair guy, and he says, the Stassi's disqualified. End of the match. For the rest of the tour that year, the Stassi was the model of great behavior. He wanted you to argue with him. And he had a gesture and everything. Just disqualify him. And there's an element in that that carries over Coaching, I think, in the NBA, for example, playing time. They can, they can get their salaries cut. They're so big, what's the difference? Let's fit them. That's, you know, that's the answer. And Spassky was great after that. He's the hell of a player, as yes. you know. Yeah, I don't know what I call the master. Yeah. He was a very charming guy, actually. Um, I'm amazed at telling some the players. Well, he was also the tournament director. So he's directing from the truck, and then he walks out, you know, during the tirade. They don't give me that much power during this <laughs> Soon, soon. Still working on it. very good. Now, you spent uh, a good number of years, a long time, but working as an announcer for the next. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that was in the good old days or the nice or the bad old days. Actually, it was both, because even in the bad old days, they had Rick Barry, who was one of the all-time greats. But in the good old days, was Dr. J. And then getting into the NBA, which was something else, because um, the NBA guys really didn't know how good some of the guys were in the ABA. And there was an exhibition, the first exhibition game between the Knicks and the Nets, which was more than just an exhibition game. How would these guys from the ABA do against the season NBA veterans? Phil Jackson, who was a player then for the Knicks, told me after the game that he couldn't believe how good some of these guys were. And his only other wish was that, or his only wish, was that the NBA get that red, white, and blue ball, which had a great feel to it, and drop the old one. But they learn quickly, good is good, you know. And uh, the four teams of, of the NBA, of the ABA, did extremely well in the NBA. I just think the Nets are going to have a good year. Well, it sure does. Um, you know, sometimes you can get too many All Stars, which means that two or three of them are not going to be All Stars the next year because they're going to have to defer in some way. But I think with Jason Kidd as coach, even if he makes some mistakes, it won't be like some other guy. It's Jason Kidd. He knows what he's doing. He made a mistake. So what? Um, players, wrong or right, like somebody who's been through the mill. Mm-hmm. You know, he's good things. Well, they've got um, they've got a bench that would be a starting team on some teams. I mean, they're really, and I don't think. 
you know, you can have too many stars. Um, I don't think that'll be a problem with them. Um, these guys have been around long enough where a championship really is what they want. They've got enough money. <laughs> they really do. Um, so I can't imagine, you know, there'll be a few slumps in there somewhere, but I can't imagine them losing four games in a row twice. You can make a lot of lots of these that are very happy. Oh, is that why we have some Nets fans? Yeah. Good. I don't know why. But tell me about some of the experiences you've had as a fan. You're on television. In the arena or in the studio? Oh, both. Okay. Well, the big thing, of course, with the arena is that you usually don't have those deadlines. You know, that copy's got to be in by so-and-so. We can't get it up on the front or in time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, most people like, if they have a choice, of doing the arena. Because, you know, you're calling what you're looking at, and there's not that much preparation, really, especially if you've been through a couple of rounds. Um, in the studio, different ball game entirely, as, as you can imagine, where you have a deadline. And, and the big thing is, usually the sport goes in the last or next to last section of the newscast, or block, whatever they call it. Um, so if somebody's goofing and has run too long, or there's a mechanical problem, and they get down to the sports, and you, you've written four minutes worth of copy with tape, um, and they come and say, two minutes, that's all you got, two minutes. Well, I learned my lesson the hard way. If you're in the bottom section of the newscast and you're doing sports, you better put the tape up in the front of your section because they may not get to, you know, you in time, or they may start running the tape and you're out of time anyway. So little things like that. Um, but I like studio better because I like the writing part. You know, some guys um, don't like that and they prefer to do a game and have a meal afterwards and go home. So when you're in the studio, you say you've got a few people there, you've got some newscasts and you're the weather person. When you're on camera, what's going on? So that's the well, I'll, I'll tell you, you one funny story. This was at uh, PIX, and the anchors were Bill Jorgensen um, and Pat Harper, mm -hmm. who had been around. She was terrific. Anyway, Jorg Jorgensen was a smoker. I was sitting closer to him than I am to you right now. Bill, Bill had this deep fossil one. And now with his sports, here's Bob Goldstone. And he had a cigarette. I'm telling you, he smoked a cigarette while I was in what they call a one shot, the only one on camera. And he had some magical way. I hope you're doing one shot at the last minute. Yeah. <laughs> he's he's um, smoking a cigarette while I'm doing the sports like this. He had some magical way without waving his hand where the smoke never passed this imaginary line. Never. I, to this day, I don't know how he did it. He just blew it out in a certain way. Um, but that was an experience, sitting next to a guy smoking and you know, people out there never knew. Did he do anything magical with a cigarette? Uh, no, I don't think so. Just in the scalp underneath, you know. <laughs> but he was a pro of pros. Look at that. Um, and then in, in the arena, you know, some funny interviews. Um, one night we had Red Auerbach, the solo coach on, who was now starting the scout NBA ABA game because they were going to merge. So I had him on one night, and the Indiana State marching band is performing on the gym floor at halftime. And when they got to that end of the floor, I would ask him a question, and he would answer the question. And then as the band came down to our end, we had to shut up, so it was just in red. And then the U-turn, back they went, next question. So we had some funny moments. Very good. One of the things that disturbs me in live broadcast like that is uh, the, the background music. 
I mean, I can't hear the commentators half the time. So it would seem to me that you could uh, change the mic and so on. Well, more of the best. Some of the teams pipe in audience sound. <laughs> uh, sometimes they just don't balance it right. Um, but I do know some teams, and you can really tell if, it, if you're listening for it. We had a thing once that um, this was on a Channel 2 where Tiger Woods was playing in a golf tournament, I think in Detroit at the time. Anyway, to the what they call beauty shots, just the grass and the flowers. It had these chirping birds. You know, really was pretty. Good sound. <laughs> we got a letter from a guy who was a, what's the term for a bird specialist? Not a bird specialist. Whatever. A bird specialist. Something's wrong. That bird is indigenous to the southwest. It would never be in Detroit. Sure enough, they were piping in. I think it was CBS. They answered. Uh, they were piping in bird sounds just to make it sound nice. <laughs> Good old TV, huh? Good old TV. There's things that change so much. I noticed if you're listening to Yankees game. In fact, you and I talked about that. What what happens between pitches? What what is going on there? What do you think? There's some. There isn't just one guy's opinion. Okay, it's his man. There's some theory. I don't know where it started. The people who were watching baseball on TV just got off a boat from. A third world country, but they may know soccer, but they don't know baseball. Each pitch, each foul ball is explained. I mean, first of all, three guys in the booth forget about it. You know, they're going to talk. Um, you, you look at some of the um, tapes from the uh, 56 World Series, Yankees Dodgers, they shut up between pitches. Shut up. We don't need everything analyzed, I don't think. But I was listening to a Yankee game. This was the height of commercialism. This was about three years ago. And Hideki Matsui was playing for the Yankees. And he was injured this particular night. And I forget who was filling in for him. So Susan Waldman, who had to read the copy, says, um, this at bat, the sponsor at bats now. If Hecky, if the Ducky Matsui were here tonight, his at bat will be sponsored by Benny Hanna of New York. And it would fell off my chair. One, to do that, and two, to have the commercial run when he wasn't even there. You know, if he were here tonight, if he's sponsored by Benny, I mean, every pitch, they give you the weather forecast, I find it very hard to take. Yeah. Well, I, as I say, one guy's opinion. I know they have to pay the bills. Um, but there's a, there's a limit. Don't you think? Oh, I definitely think that. I, know. I want you to go out on the limb here, Barry. I do. Well, let me tell you what I, what I really think. <laughs> okay. I don't want to get into much trouble, right? But, uh, tennis has some good announcers. Yes. I like most of the hockey announcers. But here's one for you. I guess I may bring it up. I have yet to meet a person the God's Honest Truth, who watched Monday Night Football back in the Cosell, Gifford, Don Meriden days, mm -hmm. because of the announcers. People will tune out because of the announcers. But what I say because of the announcers, I'm saying, in other words, they weren't going to watch the game that night, but because Cosell and Gifford, yes. and I know presidents of ABC and CBS Sports swear it's true, I'm defending myself by saying I've never met anybody who's done that. Okay, who, who has watched it because of it? Because you know, a lot of people tune out. I come close as a fan to watching a game because of the announcer. Close. Um, there's a hockey announcer who I just think is the best in the business, named Doc Emmerich, who has respect for the English language. Um, he's just brilliant with his description of a game and the and his anecdotes with, that he puts in there at the right time. Do you have any anecdotes either from your playing days or your announcement days? Well, I can tell you one about my first year in Canada. Um, now, it was funny. The first year I mentioned earlier, I was in Hastings, Nebraska. That was an all-rookie league. 
with guys just out of college and a few high school phenoms. This was a league that had some ex-major leaguers in it on the way down, yes. but not not so far removed, you know, a year or two from the big leagues. So I wore thick glasses in those days, and the first game I pitched, oh, before I pitched, mm-hmm. they were short on players that night. Two guys were injured, and the first baseman was going to pitch the second game of a doubleheader. So the manager, I haven't played yet, comes up to me and says, go into right field for one inning because we're going to rest our first baseman. I have never played any position but pitcher. They stick me in right field. It's dusk when the lights, which weren't good to begin with, weren't good. And I got these thick lenses, and I can't play the outfield. Sure enough, first guy up. I, I know it's coming my way because I see everybody turning around. I give it this, and the ball drops six feet from me. The crowd is booing me before I've thrown the ball. Mm-hmm. But I, it, I didn't think it was so funny at the time, but as I look back, I wanted to yell out, Judge me by how I pitch. This is not my position. But I didn't, and everything worked out. Okay. Well, I'm glad it got to do the next career yeah. out of baseball, which I guess was well, yeah. good. <laughs> I've had shoulder replacements since. Um, I think you're going to tell me that your face to catch the lighting is so bad they thought oh. you're actually caught it. God. Well, it's good. It's good to know where you stand and where you did. Well, uh, whatever you did. And obviously, you've done, you've done enough to, to know that. Both as a sports person and as a sports cast. And there were people watching who will disagree with announcing, and that's the way it should be. But we, we should, you know, argue or debate or talk about stuff like that. People want to read about A-Rod anymore, you know, and then you turn the next page and this guy's thrown in jail, and now the kid from Texas, um, Johnny Menziel, Mr. Football, supposedly was getting paid to sign autographs, which is a no-no. I mean, everything is, a lot of the fun has gone out. Well, I'm glad you said that because uh, our plan is unfortunately not to see Thank you very good. However, next week, uh, we are going to be coming up with a literary. So uh, stay with us at Carousel. We're going from good sports talk to climbing around and then hop on a carousel and ride around to another good stuff. So thanks for watching. Bob, thank you very much for coming here. I wish I had any time to tell you where it's like <laughs> to buy all and thanks again. Thanks, Barry.